Welcome to the enchanting world of Rajana and the city of Alizond. I'm Deontay Walton, your narrator and the author of this extraordinary tale. As we embark on this auditory journey together, allow me to introduce you to a world where magic dances with reality and courage knows no bounds. In a city that lies beyond the reach of ordinary eyes, a place steeped in mystery and wonder, Young Kiara discovers an ancient artifact that holds the key to her destiny. With each turn of the page, you'll be transported to a realm where magical creatures roam and secrets unravel. As the story unfolds, you'll meet a cast of characters, each with their own strengths and flaws, whose paths intertwine in unexpected ways. From charismatic and daring Kiara herself to the enigmatic inhabitants of the city of Alizond, Prepare to be captivated by their trials and triumphs, their sorrows and joys. As the narrator of this audiobook, I'm thrilled to guide you through this fantastical journey. Together, we'll explore the depths of the city of Alisan, its hidden quarters, and grand landmarks, immersing ourselves in its rich tapestry of sights, sounds, and emotions. So sit back and relax and allow your imagination to soar. The adventure awaits, dear listeners, as we step into the extraordinary world of Rajana and the city of Alizan. Prepare to be enthralled for magic and wonder are just a turn of the page away. Now let us begin our journey together. Rajana and the city of Alizan. Chapter 1. Kiara. As Kiara sat quietly and comfortably in the lush air-conditioned passenger seat of her mother's full-size luxury silver-color SUV, she immersed herself in a world of digital connections and boundless creativity. Although she appeared to be engrossed in texting her friends on her special edition Luso and Forte chrome-plated blade flip phone, her engagement with media and technology ran deeper than met the eye. Kiara's engineering father recognized her early affinity for all things digital. Even before age four, he introduced her to the wonders of computers, laying the foundation for her technological prowess. Year after year, as a symbol of his love, and perhaps to bridge the gap of their limited time together, he faithfully gifted her a new mobile phone on her birthday. Kiara became an East Lab baby before the term even existed, eagerly exploring the virtual and multimedia realm. During weekends spent at her father's house, Kiara's passion for technology reached new heights. She dedicated countless hours to her computer chair, fully immersed in the boundless possibilities offered by the digital landscape. As she entered the seventh grade, her desire for the state of the art manifested in her request for a Captivate, an unparalleled smartphone, one of the first, that seamlessly merged mobile communication and handheld gaming. Her father, understanding her unwavering commitment, surprised her with the coveted device as a Christmas gift, despite its hefty price tag of $700. With each passing year, Kiara's discerning taste continued to grow. By the time she reached middle school, she had developed a fascination for luxury brands appreciating their craftsmanship and allure. However, it's important to note that her parents did not indulge her every whim. Instead, they instilled in her the value of hard work and perseverance. Kiara learned the importance of striving for her desires, even if it meant putting in extra effort. An example of this was her diligent pursuit of a fake Chiche sun visor in sixth grade, a coveted item that required dedication and commitment. Maybe she hadn't asked for a fake Chiche, but she was happy with what she got. Technology and luxury seamlessly intertwined the vibrant tapestry of Kiara's life. Her father's nurturing of her technological skills and unwavering curiosity nurtured her passion for the digital realm. Kiara embarked on a unique journey to shape her future endeavors. 
with each new milestone and acquisition, her understanding of the intricacies of technology and luxury grew, fueling her determination to push boundaries and carve out her path in this dynamic world. Still, Kiara navigated through a digital landscape where trends, fashion, and technology converged. With a keen eye for what was current and a passion for artistic expression, Kiara's journey extended far beyond popular gadgets and fashion. She reveled in the visual feast of television, drawing inspiration from its vibrant imagery and captivating narratives. In her sketchbook, she imagined her life as a media mogul. Each stroke of her pencil or brush became an opportunity to shape a unique vision and infuse her art with the vibrancy and energy that would define her as a rising star in pop art. She possessed an innate ability to capture the essence of contemporary culture in her artwork, reflecting the ever-evolving pulse of society. Her talent went beyond mere replication. She profoundly understood the intricate relationship between popular culture and individual identity. Through her art, Kiara seamlessly blended consumerism, mass media, and personal experiences, creating a vivid tapestry that resonated with a diverse audience. But Kiara's innovative spirit and willingness to push artistic boundaries set her apart. Her creations transcended traditional mediums, embracing technology, mixed media, and unconventional materials. She fearlessly experimented with new techniques, combining digital elements with traditional craftsmanship and infusing her works with an electrifying energy that defied categorization. But alas, everything that glitters is in gold. Kiara, at 14, found the world she was navigating was complex, where societal expectations clashed with her desires. While many of her male peers engaged in sports, she felt out of place and faced constant reminders of her differences. Whether from her parents, classmates, or struggles with fluctuating weight, the pressure to conform was relentless. Despite her genuine interest in sports like cheerleading and dance, Kiara wasn't allowed to pursue them. Society dictated what she should or shouldn't participate in based on her assigned gender. As she approached her first year of high school, class of 2009, Kiara played her role, putting on a facade of a perfect life. However, deep inside, something ate away at her consciousness, gradually eroding her sense of self. Kiara shouldered the weight of being a first daughter, burdened by her mother and stepfather's expectations. Yet her parents expected her to conform to societal norms as a young man. Her adolescence was fraught with difficulties, unbeknownst to her identity as a transgender girl. And how could she have known? Her mother would gather the children in the living room and read Bible passages, emphasizing the religious condemnation of queerness. She hadn't discovered the vibrant world of ballroom culture or any other magic realm. She realized that her suburban environment had inadvertently sheltered her from a more fitting realm for the expression and energy of young transgender women. Without older members of the LGBT community or allies to serve as role models, she had no way of comprehending that the transgender women she saw on television, subjected to mockery and derogatory slurs, thrived in their worlds. In the mirror, Kiara saw a beautiful young Black girl with long, straightened hair and full lips. Yet, she also glimpsed the profound pain and sadness she had carried for so long. It had become her constant companion, blending into the background like a dark canvas against which her reflection stood. Lost in thought, memories of her family flooded her mind between text messages. Her mother and stepfather professed their devout Christianity, but their commitment to attending church wavered and they frequently changed congregations. Nevertheless, they believed they were imparting their beliefs to their children. From a young age, Kiara sensed her differences from her siblings, and her younger brother, though unable to articulate it, admired her for it. Unconsciously, he contributed to Kiara's marginalization, treating her queerness with fear and mockery as societal norms dictate for young Black boys. Subconsciously, Kiara never felt she fit into the mold her parents had set for her. It went beyond struggling with her gender identity. 
she endured emotional abuse and grooming within the confines of her own home, leaving her trapped in a trans-like state. Expressing discontentment with her surroundings led to reminders of her supposed flaws, dismissing her as catty and feminine. Kiara's parents taught her she was a cisgender male, destined to lead a conventional cis-heterosexist lifestyle, and that she should embrace it. Whenever she attempted to express her authentic self to her family, they dismissed her and told her she was confused. The weight of her family's expectations constantly burdened her. Her parents expected her to be the perfect son, following in their footsteps and bringing them pride. The notion of becoming everything they never wanted for her seemed impossible. As she gazed at the passing rows of mass-produced houses along the highway, in a daze but still picking up some of her mother's phone conversation, her body felt detached from reality. Deep within her subconscious, like a caged lion in a circus, Kiara longed to break free from the emotional abuse and neglect inflicted by her family. The sweltering summer sun beat down on the hood of the SUV as it rolled down the highway, but the AC went full blast in the interior. The truck entered the Diversity Meadows subdivision, and heads turned as it glided into the cul-de-sac at the end of East Rich Court, a quiet suburban street, and rolled up to one of the two impressive hilltop houses within. With two small ranch-style homes on either side of them, the large houses perched on the hilltops like royalty commanded attention and admiration from the neighboring dwellings. As Phaedra, Kiara's mother, pulled up to her sprawling home on the hill, she sighed, exasperated. She was livid about the scratches and makeshift plywood ramp on her newly paved driveway, resulting from some over-enthusiastic kids who thought it would make the perfect place to skateboard. Phaedra leaped out of the SUV, her perfectly coiffed hair bouncing in the breeze. With a determined glint in her eye, she marched up the driveway and into the house to change out of her neutral tone pantsuit and into an even more chic and expensive matching hot pink yoga pants and athletic bra that hugged her curves in all the right places. It wasn't long before she knocked on the doors of every home on the block determined to find out which children had been responsible for the scratches on her precious driveway. Her anger was palpable, and the parents of the offending kids on the block knew better than to cross her. As she made her rounds, Kiara couldn't help but gawk at her mother's antics. She admired her mother's confidence and ability to get a job done. She didn't know any better. Neither did she realize that her mother's outrage was all a part of her carefully crafted image as a sheet and sophisticated suburban mom. She found the whole situation entertaining and a little funny. She didn't realize she aspired to be like her mother. Sandra Abel, a stunning Black woman in her mid-30s, was a regional director and a customer care call center for a nationwide telecommunications company. Growing up in a working-class family in the Midwest, Phaedra always had a strong work ethic and a drive to succeed. She put herself through college and started as a customer service representative at the phone company, working her way up the ranks with a combination of talent and relentless determination. Despite the demanding nature of her job and the pressure of managing a team of over 50 employees, Phaedra always presented herself with immaculate grace and poise often wearing designer clothing and shoes that screamed success. She seemed like an excellent role model for her children. Phaedra marched down the street, her step determines, the perfectly manicured lawns and elegant houses stood as witnesses to her wrath. She stopped at the first house, adorned with a golden number plaque reading 433. Phaedra knocked on the door, and a Mrs. Angela Wilson opened it, surprised to see Phaedra. Angela is in her early 40s. She's older, but a lot more naive and intimidated by Phaedra. Phaedra, hi, how are you? Angela's nerves are palpable. Phaedra at her door shocked her. She knew something was wrong. Some of the children decided to make a skate ramp on my driveway. 
I can see the appeal, but I want to assure all the children on the block that my driveway is not a skate park, nor a place to hang out when my family and I aren't at home. Angela wasn't the type to make a fuss about these sort of things, but she knew Phaedra well enough now to know this wouldn't go away until Phaedra found the culprit and made abundantly clear to every child on the block to stay away from Phaedra's driveway. Angela called her twins downstairs. Erin and Jessica were nice girls. They told Phaedra some of the boys from the block made plans to skate on the newly paved driveway, and they tagged along to watch. They gave names. Phaedra walked to 447 East Rich Court and knocked at the Andrews door. Jacob Andrews answered, and Leslie Andrews came when she realized it was Phaedra to warn their boys not to skate on her driveway again. Leslie was intrigued that Phaedra would go as far as to knock on people's door for something so mundane, but she pretended to support Phaedra on her crusade. Leslie's boys tried to lie about their involvement in building and playing on the makeshift skate ramp, but the Wilson twins had already ratted them out. Phaedra warned Leslie she wasn't afraid to call the police on Leslie's children if she saw them on her driveway again. Phaedra visited Justin Walter's house last, Justin was the ringleader. Phaedra knew Justin to be defiant and unrepentant. So what if we did? It's not hurting anyone. It did not surprise Phaedra at the way Justin spoke to adults. He spoke that way to his mother, and Phaedra found Mrs. Walker soft. Bobby, I'll tell you like I told Leslie and Andrew. I'll call the police if I catch your child playing on my driveway again. Mrs. Walker was appalled. Justin called Phaedra a bitch, but it didn't phase Phaedra. She dealt with white male executives in her workplace calling her a bitch all the time. If you know I'm a bitch, then you should stop playing games with me. Phaedra decided to keep some of her dignity and left the conversation there. She didn't want to argue with a 13-year-old boy. Justin didn't want to show it, but Phaedra shook him. He would never skate on her driveway again. A seemingly respectable and polite woman, Phaedra had a dark side that few knew about. Deep down, she was a manipulative narcissist who enjoyed controlling those around her. When it came time to discuss high schools, she asked Kiara if she wanted to attend the same one as the pastor's son. The high school was a private Protestant Christian school that cost an exorbitant $15,000 a year. Phaedra intended to cover the cost using the child support she received from Kiara's father, which seemed quite unreasonable. In an ideal world, Kiara's mother would have been less judgmental toward inner-city neighborhoods and public schools and demonstrated a more compassionate and nurturing approach, fostering emotional stability while teaching her children to embrace the realities of the world without excessive reaction or compensating for their racial identity. Instead of planning to allocate the funds toward the expense of high school, she should have considered investing it in Kiara's future college education. However, Phaedra's priorities revolved more around intellectual pursuits, social status, and financial success than valuing courage and genuine friendship. Deep down, Kiara's desires held little significance for Phaedra. It was unreasonable for Phaedra to expect Kiara to achieve excellent grades or gain admission to a reputable college, as Phaedra wasn't actively involved in Kiara's education or her life as much as Phaedra believed. Phaedra often boasted about Kiara's ability to care for herself and her maturity beyond her years, recounting antidotes of Kiara making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for herself from age four. Kiara despised peanut butter. Phaedra bore a complete lack of awareness as a caregiver. When Kiara didn't show up as the perfect firstborn son Phaedra always wanted, Phaedra would casually remind Kiara that she was only legally obligated to provide necessities like food and shelter, considering it a clever remark that showcased her own supposed goodness. Yet it only highlighted the extent of her abusive, and neglectful behavior as a mother. Phaedra would threaten punishments if Kiara didn't meet academic expectations or behave well in school, using it to control her. She never committed to consistently assisting Kiara with her studies, 
rarely helping her with homework and merely inquiring about its completion to intimidate Kiara. Still, Kiara was excited about attending the prestigious school and eagerly agreed. Kiara was so naive and didn't fully understand the true cost of her mother's offer. In Kiara's heart, she knew that she was different from the other kids in Diversity Meadows. She struggled with her queerness and subconsciously felt trapped in a world that didn't understand her. She had no friends in the neighborhood and spent most of her time locked in her bedroom, dancing in front of the mirror to her favorite girl group, Electric Angels, or sketching. Deep down, she longed to break free from the chains that bound her and discover who she was. The idea of attending a private Christian school seemed like the perfect solution. Kiara thought maybe she could find acceptance and understanding there. She was eager to explore the world beyond her family's narrow belief and to discover a new community that would embrace her for who she was. But the suburbs was suffocating Kiara. She felt like an outsider in her skin. She didn't understand that attending the private school would only reinforce the toxic belief she was trying to escape, or that her mother's offer was another form of manipulation and control to keep Kiara under her mother's thumb. As the day wore on, the incident with the skateboarders became the talk of the block. While the other parents whispered behind closed doors, Kiara couldn't help but chuckle. In a neighborhood where image was everything, her mother was the queen of the cul-de-sac, determined to protect her kingdom from any perceived threats, no matter how trivial they may be. As Kiara settled into her room, surrounded by all the trappings of what seemed a privileged suburban life, she couldn't help but feel detached. She wasn't aware that her family's obsession with appearance and status was just a veneer, hiding the emotional abuse and neglect beneath the surface. But for now, Kiara was content to sit back and relax, knowing her mother waged war on all the other parents and skateboarding children of Diversity Meadows. After all, there was never a dull moment in their little corner of the world. Later that day, as the sun set, Kiara heard her stepfather's car pull into the driveway. And although Michael had become the father Kiara had never hoped for, she always was relieved when he got home. Phaedra was very hot and cold. You never knew what her attitude would be like. She often became emotionally and even physically abusive toward Kiara when she didn't get her way. Michael was sometimes Phaedra's voice of reason. Kiara wasn't aware she hoped for better father figures. She never considered any of her parents could be better parents. Maybe she resented them subconsciously, but she always blamed herself for her parents' inept qualities. That's what her parents taught her to do. She didn't realize how her biological father groomed her to take place of Phaedra, always expecting Kiara to give him complete and utter admiration for nothing more than buying her things and taking her to amusement parks every other weekend. And Kiara gave the love a mother should give to their child, to her mother, always inspiring her mother to be more creative and supporting all of her mother's creative ideas. Phaedra, on the other hand, had an affinity for discord when it came to Kiara's creative expression and questioned everything about Kiara's creative expression. Michael's car honked after he hit the lock button on his car key and the house's security system chimed, signaling the front door trigger. Heaven, Kiara's little sister and youngest sibling, ran up to Michael, hugging him tightly around his legs. Daddy, Heaven shouted. Heaven did this every day with such enthusiasm. Heaven was Michael's world, and she felt that. She didn't need to know how to articulate it. It was her life and experience. Subconsciously, Heaven understood that she was loved and protected. Kiara resented it because she couldn't possibly understand this relationship. It seemed impossible that she could ever experience it and that a man would ever love her as much as Michael loved Heaven. Michael spotted Kiara in their home office, what they dubbed the computer room, as he walked toward the kitchen. She was instant messaging her friends on the desktop computer about superficial teenage nothings and possible meetings after graduation. 
a chance to hang out with one another before they all went to different high schools. Michael asked Kiara how her day was. It was good, Kiara obliged. Just good, he asked. That's what you say every day. Michael gaslit Kiara just as much, if not more, than Phaedra. It was a team effort. If Kiara ever expressed anything other than utter joy and gratitude for being a part of this family, or failed to make eye contact while speaking to either Michael or Phaedra, they reminded her of her perceived flaws and how her discontent was becoming of a homosexual. Kiara's little brother, MJ, greeted Michael with a stylized gesture of greeting and solidarity that seemed like MJ congratulated Michael for the romantic intimacy Michael shared with Phaedra. It was strange for a 10-year-old. For their greeting on this day, they joined hands in a non-traditional handshake grip. On other days, it ended with a snap of fingers or concluded a one-armed hug. It was a symbol of a code between Michael and MJ that they excluded Kiara from. Michael put his work bag on a chair at the kitchen table and walked toward Phaedra, who was standing over the kitchen counter. She leaned toward him for a kiss, and after, Michael immediately asked about the makeshift plywood ramp on the driveway. Phaedra couldn't wait to rehash her outrage with her husband. Phaedra's heart raced as she retold the events of the afternoon. She knew he enjoyed hearing about the drama in their otherwise mundane lives. Michael, always aware of his wife's emotional needs, asked about every detail before she could insinuate that he didn't care. Michael was a man of average height with a plain appearance. He didn't possess the dashing good looks that turned heads or charm that drew people in. Nevertheless, something about him made Phaedra fall head over heels in love with him. Maybe it was his willingness to comply with whatever she and his friends asked of him. Whatever it was, it worked like magic, and Michael became the luckiest man alive. Evidently, in the eyes of Phaedra, Michael was the epitome of success. He may not have been the most charismatic or interesting person, but with Phaedra's taste and ambition on his side, he was unstoppable. She saw something in him that others didn't and Michael rose to great heights with her unwavering support. He became the man who could do no wrong in Phaedra's eyes, and she elevated him to a level of importance that he could have never achieved on his own. For Kiara, Michael was a different story altogether. He may have been the man who won her mother's heart, but he was more of a bystander in Kiara's life. He wasn't the kind of father who would pick Kiara up and twirl her around, or the kind who would engage her in meaningful conversations. It's not as if he hadn't known Kiara since she was a toddler. Kiara longed for a deeper connection with Michael, but always seemed too preoccupied with pleasing Phaedra, Heaven, and MJ to notice his stepchild's needs. Despite his shortcomings, Michael was still the man of the house, and Kiara knew better than to challenge his authority. She knew rolling her eyes or showing any signs of discontent would be considered disrespectful and unacceptable. Kiara learned to play along, overreact when Michael came home, and pretend everything was okay. However, Kiara felt invisible and disconnected from her family. She earned to express herself and for her family to see her for who she truly was, but she feared rejection and judgment. Michael asked what he always did when he arrived home. What's for dinner? Phaedra realized the drama with the skateboarders had taken precedence over feeding her children, so she asked everyone if Hobo's pizza was okay. It was a rhetorical question. No one else in the home would ever challenge Phaedra's suggestion. They did, however, rather enjoy Hobo's pizza. Hobos was a staple in the Nanavok land area because they laid cheese on their pizza extremely thick. That was even their slogan. Hobos, we lay it on thick. It's made with the finest ingredients like marinated and grilled strips of full free-range chicken breast and holds just the right amount of grease. 
Phaedra told Kiara to call Hobos and order a family-sized cheese and sausage. As everyone else prepared to watch the family's favorite reality competition show, Scraps, Island of the Idols, on the big screen TV in the great room, Kiara enthusiastically plopped down on one of the bar stools at the island kitchen countertop, flipped open her cell phone, and dialed Hobos. She nearly remembered Hobo's Pizza's number after the many times she called to order, but there was a newspaper insert stuck to the fridge using a magnet with the number on it. Kiara turned to read it to ensure that the last two digits were correct. As the woman on the other end of the line recited the order back to her, she realized she didn't have her mother's debit card in hand, so she awkwardly asked her mother for her debit card and secretly blamed herself when her mother became annoyed. Phaedra called MJ, who was still upstairs, to look for her purse in the primary suite and bring it downstairs if he found it. J.M., she yelled. Kiara broke a sweat. She blamed herself for making the hobo's pizza employee wait and for agitating her mother, and she helped look for the purse. She held the shiny, expensive flip phone between her shoulder and cheek and opened the coat closet to sift through it. Here, use my card. Michael pulled his wallet from his back pants pocket as he reclined on the blue velvet sofa with his feet raised on the matching ottoman. He raised the debit card, and Kiara grabbed it from behind him. Okay, I'm ready. Is it the card ending in 4936, ma'am? If Kiara wasn't sweating before, she was spiraling on the inside now. She couldn't handle others misgendering her. Even though she was supposed to present as a prepubescent boy, Kiara's parents expected her to be a man. The Hobo's Peace employee reminded her too much of her anxiety and fears to live up to the expectations her parents projected on her, and that deep down, she was transgender. Yep, that's the one, her voice cracked. She was incredibly embarrassed. Okay, that'll be 42.63, and we'll arrive in one hour. Pressed, Kiara shut the phone and breathed. She sat on the love seat, her elbow on the armrest, head resting on her balled-up fist. Kiara bent her knees back, tugged her feet behind her, and stared at the TV. The rest of the family huddled on the sofa, Michael and Phaedra in the middle, and they enjoyed the rest of their evening together. Kiara probably couldn't tell you what happened in the first 15 minutes of the show because she spaced out worrying about how queer she appeared to the world. Eventually, she let it go and allowed the television to captivate her. It was one of her few escapes. One might argue that the television raised her. Michael cruised down the road behind the wheel of the silver SUV. Kiara found herself behind her stepfather's seat in the second row Surrounded by the comforts of affluence, her little sister Heaven sat next to her, captivated by the vibrant display on the built-in TV, tuned to the Keller Network original movie, Harmony Unleashed, which had captivated young girls' hearts worldwide. It was a phenomenon that had become synonymous with inspiration, girl empowerment. The film revolved around the extraordinary journey of four teenage girls who sought to conquer the world through enchanting music. It resonated deeply with young audiences, igniting dreams and ambitions within their hearts. Kiara, too, found herself secretly drawn to this infectious energy, despite societal expectations suggesting otherwise. She yearned to express her appreciation for this girly phenomenon openly but the fear of judgment restrained her. So she eagerly seized any opportunity to discuss the movie whenever it felt acceptable, hoping to convey her hidden admiration subtly. The sight of the movie playing on the SUV screen sparked a stream of thoughts within Kiara's mind. It reminded her of the power of self-expression, a realm she found solace in through fashion. Keeping up with the latest trends became a form of personal outlet, and Kiara delighted in the artistry of clothing. Her mother, Phaedra, shared her passion for fashion, 
allowing them to bond over their love for everything stylish. However, this connection came at a price. As Phaedra occasionally asserted control over Kiara's wardrobe choices as punishment, Phaedra rarely bought expensive clothing for Kiara, so it was strange when she forced Kiara to wear an old pair of Wrens. Wrens were a classic canvas sneaker loved by many, but for a little black boy in the fourth grade, Wrens was social debt. It was also strange how Phaedra expected Kiara to come up as a cisgender heterosexual male, but loved to emasculate Kiara with these sort of subtle, cruel punishments. When she wasn't punishing Kiara, and all seemed well in Kiara's world, Kiara would present her ideas to Phaedra, seeking Phaedra's approval and hoping to retain some semblance of control over her fashion expression. During an early high school orientation, Kiara encountered a group of even more affluent, yet predominantly white, prospective students. They each wore a different t-shirt marked by Ravage and Rebellion, a clothing brand tailored specifically for teenagers and young adults, a brand that exuded Rebellion. Ravage and Rebellion, or R&R as everyone called it, alienated parents and pushed boundaries. The company gained notoriety for its bold marketing tactics, featuring homoerotic photos of shirtless male models in its advertisements. Ripped jeans marked the brand's aesthetic, ruffled t-shirts, distressed hoodies, and a signature scent that commanded attention like a skunk spray. Curious and seeking her mother's opinion, Kiara asked Phaedra if it was okay that she shot at Ravage and Rebellion. It was audacious for Kiara. Phaedra looked at Michael with a raised brow. Michael didn't understand the shock. He was wildly dowdy, but what would he think if he were more aware of the homoerotic nature of ravage and rebellion? Like his love for sports, he would likely excuse the chest-to-chest male action that appeared in a ravage rebellion campaign as long as it's what all the popular guys did. Phaedra's interests peaked, and she certainly approved but she appeared indifferent and uninvolved in her response. Is that what you're into? Phaedra replied. She tried her best not to show any enthusiasm, but she was bursting at the seams and couldn't help but grin. Phaedra, who championed Kiara's desire for acceptance, often embraced ideas that aligned with societal expectations than with Kiara's true identity, and her pursuit of making Kiara fit into the mold of a normal boy, she often overstepped boundaries. She even came off as a sexual predator sometimes to her child, leaving Kiara feeling uncomfortable and disconnected from her authentic self. The pressures of societal norms influenced Phaedra's approach to parenting and her desire for Kiara to conform to traditional gender roles. Phaedra made choices she didn't fully understand, care to understand, or acknowledge about Kiara's individuality and unique experiences. By trying to reinforce certain behaviors or interests upon Kiara, Phaedra unintentionally reinforced the idea that being different was undesirable and that conforming to societal expectations was the ultimate goal. While Phaedra's support may have seemed encouraging on the surface, it often left Kiara feeling trapped and misunderstood, as if to disregard Kiara's true self in favor of fitting into societal norms. Despite the conflict between their desires and intentions, Phaedra and Kiara both yearned for acceptance and connection. And although many considered Ravage and Rebellion's imagery exaggerated and occasionally vulgar, Phaedra saw it as an avenue for Kiara to explore her teenage individuality and for Kiara to blend in with her peers. Her support for Ravage and Rebellion encouraged Kiara, reassuring her that her desire for self-expression was valid, even if it deviated from Christian and conventional norms. In the cocoon of the SUV, surrounded by her family and the allure of a movie celebrating dreams and music, Kiara contemplated the complexities of her identity. 
She yearned to break free from the confines of society's expectations to embrace her true self without fear of judgment or rejection. For now, fashion served as a temporary escape, a way to express the vibrant hues of her soul while navigating the delicate dance of acceptance and authenticity. And so as the SUV glided along, Kiara allowed herself to dream of a future where self-expression would no longer be a clandestine act, but a celebration of who she truly was. Michael exited off the expressway into Phaedra's childhood neighborhood. It was about a 40-minute drive from the Diversity Meadows subdivision on the 4th of July. They had just arrived at Phaedra's late grandmother's home, a modest dwelling that held sentimental value. Phaedra's childhood neighborhood exuded a sense of familiarity and nostalgia. The house, though not grand, carried the strength of Phaedra's father's craftsmanship. As Phaedra stepped out of the SUV, a local who always seemed to be outside whenever she visited greeted her. Hey, Hollywood, he shouted. That's how he greeted her every single time he saw Phaedra. He embarrassed and agitated Phaedra at times, but it would strike her as a cause for concern if the man no longer saw her as the glamazon that she was. The man's name remained unknown to Kiara and her siblings. Phaedra exchanged greetings with a fake grin, her pink stiletto heels and fluffy pink feathered toes contrasting with her jeans. Phaedra's favorite cousin announced her in her family's arrival. Faye here too. He yelled as he walked through the front door of the humble bungalow. Idra was the bougie aunt to Kiara's cousins. Soon, the entire extended family filled the two-level house, exchanging blessings and greetings. The narrow house resembled a brownstone. Although much smaller and made of regular orange brick, it lacked the same grandeur. However, its spacious lawn stretched from the front to the back, providing a sense of openness. Phaedra's aunts approached, enveloping her and her cousin in warm embraces, feigning shock at how much Kiara and the other children had grown. Kiara felt excitement and nervousness, returning to where she spent many childhood summers with her favorite cousin. Kiara's apprehension grew when she considered reuniting with her favorite cousin's older sister and her older male cousins. They were the first to challenge Kiara's identity, causing her to struggle with proving her masculinity. The carefree running up and down the block on Madison Avenue had transformed into more mature strolls. Despite this change, Kiara still felt a sense of anticipation as she rejoined her cousins. After a day filled with dancing, eating, walking under the blazing sun and lighting firecrackers, Kiara noticed the lingering sense of outside in the 4th of July on her. Seeking a moment of reflection, she entered the downstairs bathroom in her late great-grandmother's bedroom to refresh herself. The room stirred memories within her, and as she passed by the closet, she opened its door to reveal her great-grandmother's house robes. Her great-grandmother, who had always made her feel loved and accepted, especially during her formative years, seemed to guide her even from the spirit realm. Kiara's gaze fell upon her reflection in the bathroom mirror after she washed her hands, sticky from barbecue sauce residue, where, away from the influence of the girl she dreamed of being, she recognized her handsomeness. Then a rattling noise interrupted Kiara's introspection from her great-grandmother's antique jewelry box. At first, she dismissed it as a hallucination, but the persistent shaking startled her again. Rushing to the box, she tried to hold it down and found herself overpowered by its force. Eventually, Kiara opened one of the tiny drawers to figure out what caused it to shake the way it did. Inside the drawer was a luminous pink pearl ring with a gold setting. As she picked up the ring, a gust of wind swept through the room, and energy surged through her veins. At that moment, the room transformed into a swirling vortex of colors and light, and it irresistibly pulled Kiara into a portal. 
Tumbling through the gateway, she experienced weightlessness, catching glimpses of her late great-grandmother guiding her through the mystical realm. Whispers of ancestral wisdom echoed, encouraging her to embrace her heritage and tap into her hidden power. The portal spat Kiara out onto the sandy shores of a gulf in the south. As she gathered her bearings, she noticed a beautiful black woman seated on the sand, exuding an aura of contentment. Adorned in a powder blue dress with oversized leg of mutton sleeves and a flared skirt that gave her a sculpted, well-defined hourglass shape and a popular penned-up hairstyle of her time, the woman's slim yet curvy figure added to her captivating presence. The woman turned her gaze toward Kiara and bestowed her with a warm smile, her eyes reflecting wisdom and familiarity that piqued Kiara's curiosity. Suddenly, the scenery shifted and Kiara found herself floating in the night sky, bathed in an ethereal glow of the full moon. To her astonishment, she witnessed the woman gracefully soaring on a broomstick, moving through the air with a mesmerizing slowness. It's as if the world was stuck in a time warp, time itself moving at a glacial pace. The woman looked Kiara in the eye, her gaze piercing right through Kiara, placed her finger over her lips and signaled Kiara to be silent, creating a soft yet full swishing sound that reverberated throughout the cosmos. Kiara reached out, hoping to catch her, but the woman glided past Kiara, her movements exuding a sultry and seductive allure. A wolf howled in the distance, adding an air of mystery and enchantment to the moment. As the scene transformed again, Kiara floated into outer space. The earth appeared far below. Its vastness and beauty were both awe-inspiring and terrifying. The woman and her broom now adorned in a sleek, gold-plated armor that covered her entire body continued her graceful flight. Kiara, caught in the weightlessness of space, felt her breath escaping her, realizing the impossibility of survival without a space suit. Time seemed to slow down, amplifying the moment's intensity before returning to its normal pace. The woman circled Kiara, spinning her gently, and then she winked before speeding away into the distance. The setting shifted again, revealing the woman kneeling before a majestic angel, the angel clad in matching gold-plated armor to that of the woman, his wings a stark contrast in pristine white commanded attention. They stood upon clouds in a circle of other awe-inspiring angels, atop a flight of cloud stairs a grand throne awaited. Time fluctuated between slow motion and normal speed as Kiara remained suspended. The angel, adorned with a bright red cape crafted from the finest velvet, performed a ceremonial knighting of the woman with a massive flame and gold sword. The gesture symbolized an extraordinary bond and destiny unfolding before Kiara's eyes. Once again, the scene transformed, and now, the woman, still adorned in her gold armor, sat confidently upon the throne. A tiara graced her head now, its centerpiece, a luminous pearl. From within the pearl, a majestic white specter of a panther emerged, its fur glistening as brightly as the jewel itself. The creature let out a powerful roar and symbolized its role as guardian and protector. In the last shift, Kiara stood before the woman and an equally striking man, reminiscent of a medieval warrior king. The woman stood beside the king, emanating an aura of regal elegance in her opulent gold gown. Crafted with meticulous attention to detail, the gown draped around her figure with grace and grandeur. The shimmering tapestry of gold silk fabric caught the light and reflected it in a cascade of ethereal radiance. The woman's atelier adorned the gown with intricate embroidery and delicate lunar patterns woven with threads of pure gold. 
Swirling motifs and intricate designs mirroring the cosmos created a mesmerizing tapestry across the fabric, capturing the eye and inviting admiration. Each stitch was a testament to the craftsmanship and artistry that went into creating this masterpiece. The silhouette of the gown was both flattering and majestic. It embraced the woman's curves gently, accentuating her graceful form. The neckline was adorned with an intricate beading using pearls of all different sizes and jewels and framed her face with a touch of luxury. Cascading layers of silk and chiffon added a sense of fluidity to her every gesture. The train of her gown showed behind her, flowing like a river of gold, leaving a trail of elegance in her wake. Every little gesture she made exuded confidence and poise the embodiment of a queen in her splendid attire. Completing her ensemble were ornate accessories. Her crown, adorned with natural lusty pearls, adorned her head, catching the light and casting a soft glow upon her features. The man stood tall and commanding, embodying the essence of a warrior king. His presence filled the space with an aura of strength and authority. As a strapping young black man, he exuded a regal and powerful energy that captivated all who beheld him. His skin, a rich umber tone, possessed a mesmerizing quality. Bathed in the light, it seemed to shimmer with cool, jeweled tones, hinting at the depths of his inner strength. His features were sculpted with precision, conveying a sense of determination and resilience. Long, flowing locks cascaded down his back, their ebony hue so deep that it almost took a mystical shade of blue in certain lighting. Each lock was a testament to his heritage, symbolizing his identity and connection to his roots. His armor, forged from solid gold, gleamed with craftsmanship. Adorned with intricate engravings and embellishments, it reflected the light and exuded an air of power and invincibility. Yarmor hugged his form, accentuating his muscular physique and serving as a visual testament to his strength on the battlefield. Draped over his broad shoulders was a heavy red cape of the finest velvet. The vibrant hue of the fabric added a touch of power to his appearance, contrasting beautifully against the golden armor. The cape flowed behind him, symbolizing his authority and command as he moved with grace and purpose. He commanded attention and respect with every gesture, his warrior spirit evident in his posture and how he carried himself. He exuded a quiet confidence that demanded admiration. As the embodiment of a warrior king, he represented physical prowess, wisdom, compassion, and the weight of leadership. The man and woman stood on the threshold of a magical forest, facing a blacksmith and a large ominous onyx stone serving as a workspace. Their gazes locked, reflecting unwavering determination and boundless love as the man and the woman stood side by side their hands gently intertwined, a palpable energy radiated between them. Time seemed to stand still as they focused on the modest amount of pure gold before them. With a graceful and deliberate motion, they extended their hands over the gold, their palms facing down. A soft glow emanated from within as if their hearts had transformed into radiant orbs of light. A gentle hum filled the room. The harmonious conversions of their heart magic. A wondrous transformation began as their fingertips brushed the gold surface. The metal seemed to come alive, shimmering with an ethereal glow. Every ounce resonated with the essence of their love, infusing it with a mystical power that transcended the realm they were in. The forest where they stood was awash with an otherworldly luminescence as the gold transformed, taking on an iridescent hue. 
it seemed to pulse with life, pulsating with the energy of their combined souls, each atom of gold absorbed with their devotion, dreams, and persistent connection, becoming a vessel of their profound love. Without needing a cast or a forge, the gold shaped itself into a delicate, wire-thin, split pave setting, shimmering with brilliance. The angel of God descended upon the blacksmith's stone, its spirit falling upon the metal like mist, causing diamonds to form magically. The pearl, bound by spirit, found its rightful place within the golden setting. With another shift, Kiara now found herself standing at the threshold of a vast body of water brimming with mystical energy. Surrounding her were mythical creatures from African-American folklore tales she'd heard in elementary school, mermaids and nymphs. However, panic set in as Kiara realized she couldn't swim, nor could she breathe. Once again, she was underwater. As her consciousness waned, she witnessed a pair of nymphs assuming roles of guardians, swiftly swimming toward her. And so, dear listeners, we reached the end of our wondrous journey through Rajana and the city of Adazand. I hope you have enjoyed this immersive experience where imagination and reality intertwine to transport you to a realm beyond our own. But fear not, for the adventure does not end here. I invite you to join me every Monday at 8 a.m. Eastern for the release of a new chapter of this magical tale. You can find the chapters on the River Furnace Patreon at patreon.com slash riverfurnace where you'll have access to the unfolding story. Additionally, I encourage you to visit my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Deontay Welton. There, you'll find the complete audiobook allowing you to revisit the captivating world of the city of Alizon and her extraordinary journey whenever your heart desires. Before we part ways, I want to express my deepest gratitude to each and every one of you for embarking on this adventure with me. Your support and enthusiasm have made this journey all the more magical. Together, we have delved into the depths of imagination and brought this story to life. As we bid farewell to Rajana and the city of Alizan, may the lessons learned, the friendships forged, and the triumphs celebrated linger in your hearts inspiring you to embrace the extraordinary within your own lives. Thank you for joining me on this marvelous journey. Until we meet again, keep your spirits high, your dreams vivid, and remember, the magic is always within reach. Farewell, dear listeners, and may your own adventures be as extraordinary as the one we've shared. Welcome, dear readers, to Storyteller Secrets where the written word comes alive through the power of shared stories. I am your guide, Tiante Walton, the author behind... What's the name of my book again? I am your guide, Deontay Walton, the author behind the tale, Rajana and the City of Alisan. As we embark on this enchanting journey, I invite you to join me in unlocking the hidden treasures within the page of our story. In Storyteller Secrets, we will delve into the depths of inspiration, explore the intricacies of the characters, and unveil the layers of the plot. Each chapter holds its own secrets, and here, within these intimate discussions, I will reveal the whispers of the muse, the sparks that ignited my, my imagination, the sparks, that, the sparks that ignited my imagination. Each chapter... Each chapter holds its own secrets, and here, within these intimate discussions, I will reveal the whispers of the muse, the sparks that ignited my imagination, and the choices that shaped the narrative. Together, we will uncover the story's heartbeat. Together, we will uncover the hidden meanings, the symbolism, and the moments that left an indelible mark upon my soul. I am honored to have you as my companion on this voyage, truly. I really am, I'm so excited about this. Your presence breathes life into these words I penned and together we will breathe magic into the tale. So my dear readers, let us embark on this journey of discovery where secrets will be shared, insights will be unveiled, and our connections to the story will deepen. Welcome to Storyteller's Secrets. I, I love that. I love that. <laughs>
Okay. Um, what is the significance of Kiara's special edition Lusso and Forte chrome plated blade flip phone? Huh? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know if this is still the same for children. I mean, I don't think so. Cause I think like nowadays it's like every kid wants an iPhone. I think like iPhone is the hottest, but when I grew up, cell phones were kind of just like just breaking out as celebrities like <laughs> when i was a kid cell phones were kind of a little bit earlier so they had a lot more personality when i was growing up i was in love with the motorola razor i remember vividly i will never forget this i remember vividly like around eighth grade going to the movies on the weekend with my dad and one day we walked into the movie theater in the lobby and there was the motor roller razor like in this display case in all its glory like Aah! and like when we were first introduced to the motor roller razor it seemed so like out of your reach and you know like as an eighth grader i'm just I'm looking at it the epitome of everything trendy and hot right here is this cylinder of a phone. <laughs> I should also know that even before that, even before I actually got a phone, I was, I was very prone to taking like one of my parents' old cell phones that didn't work anymore, putting it in my pocket. And literally we would be at like sports games for my brother and me, who didn't play sports, I will be, like, sitting in the stand, acting like I'm talking to somebody on this phone. It wasn't on. It wasn't working. It had no service. <laughs> so, um, so, actually, there came a point in my life where, like, actually having it in my hand was such a huge source of power, Okay. And that's what it is for Kiara. Um, she's not allowed to express herself in many ways, but in the ways that she is allowed, um, which is kind of through convention, um, I'm preaching to the fucking choir here. This is shit that I'm realizing about my life and myself. Um, but her having this phone, this is one of the few ways that she can express her power She's a queer young kid, and and um, I think that a lot of people think in her life that she um, has been raised with this silver spoon in her mouth or that she's spoiled, um, but they really have no idea about the sort of prisons that she lives within and the things that she goes through to pay the price for this fucking plastic phone with a name brand listed on it the very importance of the the um the luso and forte chrome plated phone is um again at this time the cell phones were celebrities so motorola razor had this special edition gold dolce and gabbana phone and again for me this was a way to um it was one of the ways one of the few ways i had to express my individual power um given given the abuse that i was actually going through um and so it's really funny it was like at one point in my life it was it was like this sort of beacon to me behind this plexiglass um you know case that i would dream about me going into this movie theater lobby and stealing like mission impossible you know secret agent missions seeing myself like cascade down from the lobby of this movie theater and I fucking uh do this sleuth uh <laughs> laser beam the top of this display case off and pull up on it like that's how coveted it was for me so to go from that and then like like a few years later maybe two or like three years later realizing that I have had the privilege of having phones and it just got to the point where this is, I realized we're like, this is something that I'm always going to have because this is something that my dad is providing to me as a means to have a connection. And then there's also like 
the fact that my mother really enjoys when I play into conventional things. And so th these are the sort of things that I was allowed to have and the sort of power I was allowed to express. Um, and I, that's, that's what makes mean kids mean kids. Like that's what makes mean girls mean girls is that little bit of power that they're given. Like they are, they are like, they're given that power by their parents because there's so many other things that they can't do. And so they're like, well, this is the power that I have and I'm absolutely going to use it. And I absolutely used it. Um, I, I was definitely a bully like once or twice in my life. And I look back on those moments cringing, like, oh my God, like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that to that person. Um, but other than that, I, I had fun with it. People still like, you know, impose their opinions on me and hated me because of the privilege that I thought that they thought I had. I didn't have a lot of privilege, privilege, like, yeah, we lived in a nice home. Um, but there was so much that went into us having that not only my parents, um, having to go through much to get that, but also, um, the children in the house having to go through a lot of that because of what the parents were going and were going through in order to give us a life that they never had. How did Kiara's family dynamics and emotional abuse contribute to her sense of isolation and unhappiness? Um, that was, that's really a spot of magic in itself. Um, I guess it's something a little demonic and a little hellish um, because Kiara, she doesn't know that she's unhappy. She doesn't know that she's isolated and she doesn't even know that the reason why she doesn't know that she's isolated and the reason why she doesn't know she's unhappy is because she also doesn't know that she's blaming herself for the choices that her parents make. And she's blaming herself for her parents' inept qualities. So, I mean, she's really in hell, like a prison, okay? And I am, I'm proud enough and bold enough to say that there are kids who would probably be perceived as a lot less fortunate than Kiara. They're not. They're not. I wouldn't wish the suburbs on anybody. <laughs> I would not wish the suburbs on anybody. Um, and, and that's the truth. I'm sorry, that's the truth. Um, you know, kids who are, who are not subject to that sort of prison, that is the suburbs and conformity, um, they may not have all the resources. Really, Kiara didn't have a lot of resources. If we're really looking at it, all of the resources that she had, she had no control and no distribution over them. Um, it was really everything that her parents said that she can have. And her parents really didn't have a lot. That's the really sick part of conformity. It's like these people are, per are pretending that they have something. Um, you have to understand this. Even the families who actually could afford a lot and who could actually have everything, they are still missing a spirituality, a connection. And you don't have to believe in religion you can be an atheist and still understand that a key to happiness is a higher power and it is god or it is a connection to your subconscious a connection to your inner self that's spirituality that's the key to happiness and yes with that you can create wealth for yourself and sustainability for yourself um, but many times what we are actually seeing in this world as sustainability or wealth um, as health and as happiness and joy, it's really not. It's people who are chasing money instead of chasing their dreams and desires and who they truly are. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's just this inception upon inception upon inception upon it. You, okay, the sunken place has nothing on where Kiara was. 
okay? <laughs> I mean, this started at a very early age and kind of evolved as her parents became more and more successful in life. Um, and the sunken place really has nothing on where Kiara was inside of this world where everyone keeps telling her that she's supposed to be happy and she has everything and she has little to nothing at all. Not even, not even herself, not even her own imagination and her own creativity and a belief in herself. She, she's afraid of who she is. She's afraid of her sexuality. She's afraid of her identity. It's really sad. What was the significance of Kiara's mother's image as a chic and sophisticated suburban mom? Um, there's this thing, there's, there's these ideas about quiet luxury and stealth wealth. Um, and I think that there are parts of that that are true. I do think that there are wealthy people out there who truly do have a really great connection with themselves, have a really great creativity and and really great um, spirituality and who really do live a life of joy and happiness. Um, a lot of those people are really mature and chic and truthfully and honestly, they don't need a lot to, you know, you know, um, they don't need to show off. A great example of that is Carrie from Sex and the City. Um, Carrie doesn't know who she is at all. Carrie is really a really awful character. I recently just watched Sex and the City over again, and Carrie has to be the most annoying person in television history. I really was like, wow, I can't stand this lady. Um, she doesn't know who she is. She's very insecure. She's very flip, flip, floppy. I, she makes the most awful decision she makes the most awful decisions um and so characters like uh aiden and natasha um are reflections of who carrie wants to be um aiden is a great character and made a great partner and carrie's dumbass chases after big somebody who does not love her it's, it blows my mind. Um, but Natasha and Aiden are very similar. They both are very powerful. Um, they're very abundant. They're, they're both creative. They're very gentle. They're very giving. Um, and it, it, it comes, it, it hinges on uh, tradition and heritage, which they are very proud of. Natasha, you know, she works at Ralph Ron, and, you know, she's just very chic, very posh, but very understated girl. Unlike Carrie, somebody who throws on things from her past, she's dressing with bullshit. Carrie dresses like a fucking pirate. I don't understand it. Like, I don't know where this idea that she's this fashion icon came from, but I think that Carrie Bradshaw dresses like a pirate, okay? Um... <laughs> Um, and, and, and sorry to be polit politically incorrect, but like a bad, a bad depiction of a pirate from like a god awful movie. Like I, I'll just see her on the screen. I'm like, what is this? Is it supposed to be fashionable? It's hideous. And, and it's hideous not because of the way it looks, but because it's really symbolic of who Carrie is. Very indecisive. Um, but not only indecisive, we could at least excuse indecision. Um, Carrie projects in her personality and she projects in her fashion. And she's always ragging on someone who's got their shit together because she doesn't have her shit together. Um, on, in conjunction to, uh, and in juxtaposition to Natasha, you have Aiden, who is this country guy, very mellow, very relaxed. Um, he actually likes to have fun and, and can show up and be just as quirky as Carrie is, even though she can't meet him on the things that he wants to do. Um, he is always playing into her games because he has, he's very mature and he has the balance to be able to have fun with someone who doesn't have their shit together and also say the truth of who he is, this very rustic, laid back guy. I mean, you have to look at his business. Aiden is, 
you know, Carrie thinks of Aiden as like this country bumpkin, you know, who wants to frolic out in the forest, you know, build houses in the forest. But Aiden is actually a very chic, very successful furniture designer. And he's all of that because he's true to who he is and he doesn't have to overcompensate for that. Um, I say all of that to say that Kiara picks up a lot of those things from her mother and and that is the sort of thing that she believed that her mother was. She believed that there is, you know, a lot of power there. Um, and there is because Kiara's mother gets that from the heritage of their family. That's how a lot of the older women uh, in the family are. Kiara's um, great grandmother um, on her, on Kiara's um Kiara's great grandmother is Phaedra's paternal grandmother. Okay, um, but then there's also this other woman um, who is Kiara's grandmother, Phaedra's mother, who also embodies this very laid back, um, sort of like heritage, very chic, very posh style. And Kiara sees the power in that. Um, but it's completely evaded by Phaedra, someone who doesn't know who they are and much more values showing up in a way that society expects her to rather than being true to herself and allowing her children to be true to themselves as well. Um, I think that's my Amazon. Give me one. Um, what is the significance of the Keller Network original movie Harmony Unleashed and its impact on Kiara and young girls worldwide? Kiara is not very aware of a lot of the mechanics that are going on around her. Um, and I mean, most children are not. Um, that being said, she is ab absorbing everything. In and although she doesn't know the reasons for what's happening around her, she's eating it up. Even when she can't be open and vulnerable about the fact that she's eating it up. And um, I guess I can't say much because <laughs> this is the only chapter. And I don't want to give too much about the future. But yeah, at this point, she's just eating it. She's just consuming it. and. She, I guess we're in the same position as Kiara, like, she can't say much about it, she can't say much of why she likes it, other than, like, it's this very feminine and girly thing, um, but the fact that she fears being open and honest about the fact that she is something, about this, about the fact that this is something interesting to her, um, is very symbolic for the prison that she lives in. Um, it's like she can't express it, and because she can't express it, she has absolutely no idea what it means. And, I mean, that's not to say that a little girl is going to understand the power that, um, you know, that these sort of muse tropes, um, these powerful women in music, it's, it's not to say that she should even understand, you know, the path that that's leading up to about um the power of her pussy okay <laughs> but that is absolutely what it's leading up to um and so she's consuming it and eating it up the best as she can um where she is in her life kind of at this stunted growth is because she's not allowed to grow as she truly is because of the um boundaries that are projected onto her what is the significance of the mystical realm that Kiara enters through her great grandmother's antique jewelry box? How does her journey through this realm and encounters with the black woman, the flying woman on a broomstick, the angel, and the warrior king and queen shape her understanding of her heritage and hidden power? The portal that she enters through her grandmother's antique jewelry box is she's always looked up to her grandmother and as a trans feminine person she's always wanted to embody the poise and the feminine power of her grandmother and so here she is being sucked into it 
Jared's great grandmother didn't really play into the BS surrounding her queerness. She was very, um, she was very attuned to it. Um, we don't know, and Kiara doesn't know, you know, what her grandmother really thinks about it, but her grandmother at least has the disposition to create a sandbox for Kiara to express who she is, you know, um, in Kiara's younger life, you know, her grandmother is around, her grandmother hears all the whispers in her house, her grandmother hears what the children are saying, and uh, what the children are doing and 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 how they are playing um and so she kind of lets them live out those fantasies and do their thing unlike a lot of the other members um in kiara's life um but in kiara's great grandmother's death she the symbology of the of her being sucked into the portal of this antique jewelry box is that kiara's grandmother is is in death can give Kiara the world. One, because Kiara is a little bit older and now because of in the ancestral realm, her grandmother also is not bound to the expectations of society. And so she kind of pulls Kiara in, like it's time babes, like let's go out and have fun and paint the world pussy pink. Like, <laughs> it's kind of like an apology, you know, I wasn't able, I didn't give you these things, and, you know, I didn't understand this and I didn't understand this. And I knew you were that, I knew you were this type of person, but now I even know more in my death. And so let me show you what I knew in life. And also let me show you what I know in death about life and how it's going to help you being the very unique person that you are. Yeah, and that can be said for um, the angels and um, the woman on the flying broomstick and the warrior king. All of that is definitely in um, Kiara's great grandmother as a as a spirit guide. All of that is sort of this symbology of what Kiara's great grandmother is giving to her—the knowledge and wisdom that she's giving to Kiara about who Kiara really is and the power she actually holds, um, that her living uh, relatives are not willing to admit to Kiara. They know, they absolutely know. Um, but because they do not want to believe in that power for themselves, how could they ever expect to give it to someone who they look like as other, someone who they look like, who they look at and they say, oh, this person will never be anything and this person definitely won't ever be more powerful than me because of who they are. They're very weird and they're very different and I'm very powerful and poised and great and straight and, you know, <laughs> I'm exactly what the world wants. And so they couldn't possibly give these things to Kiara. They couldn't possibly tell Kiara who she really is because they don't know who they really are. And they wouldn't want Kiara to actually... Um, not fear who she is as a person, her identity, her gender, or her sexuality. Yeah. Join me every week as we explore a new chapter, releasing the magic within. Remember, a new chapter of our adventure is available every Monday at 8 a.m. Eastern on Patreon at patreon.com slash riverfurnace and on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Deontay Walton. I will see you all then. Bye.